Started. The next slide is just a review of crossword cycling. It is just different pictures and it gives students a different perspective of the same concepts right before we started learning. Here's our uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. When the calcium is released here in this middle step, we can see what happens. Prior to that, they show um, thick filaments myosin, myosin, and then, then they show the thin filaments, the actin in the middle. And this yellow portion, the active site, is covered with the uh, tropomyosin, there's the troponin. When calcium is liberated, you sweep the calcium off to the side so the active site is exposed. And as soon as the active sites are exposed, you get the cross bridge formation. So I kind of like this as a different perspective to show you the same thing. And I just kind of label the details of it on the next slide. So this is active. Specifically, the part that's yellow is the active site. And they show the troponin strand right on it and right off of it when calcium is present. Now, um, I want to switch to smooth muscle for a little bit and talk about its physiology. The smooth muscle is the involuntary muscle that lines the, uh, the viscera. In this example, they show the digestive tract. Viscera means contents or organs, GI tract. I think that's a picture of the small intestine, part of the GI tract. Now, GI stands for gastrointestinal, your digestive tract. It also lines up the insides of blood vessels. Also, your reproductive tract. Those are the main ones you'll look at. So what you see here, instead of a muscle fiber long, elongated, you just have this spindle-shaped cell with a solitary duke. And it has all the contractile proteins that the skeletal muscle has. You just don't see any striations. That's why it's called smooth muscle for its appearance. And instead of axon terminals, the autonomic nerve fibers create these little varicosities that interact with smooth muscle. So they're controlled by a different system, the autonomic nerves. little varicosities with the neurotransmitters and mitochondria inside them. You have little vesicles. I'll put NTs for neurotransmitters that will be all up inside there. So I imagine these are filled with neurotransmitters. And there's a lot of mitochondria, because you need energy to do this release. Little, I'll draw a little mitochondria. I want to give you some details of what's in this structure called the, the varicosities. I just drew one, but instead of the axon terminal, you have the varicosities. You can see on the figure how they interact with the layers of smooth muscle. And I just drew one smooth muscle cell. Understand that smooth muscle, they don't exist as solitary cells as a tissue, many layers. That's all I'll put for its organization, many layers. For skeletal muscle, it was a very complex organization. We broke it down, whole muscle, fascicle, 
muscle fibers, myofibril, all that stuff. I'll just say there are many layers of these spindle-shaped cells. And so what happens is um, in this spindle-shaped cell, you have these intermediate filaments with these little buttons called dense bodies. I'm writing to have filaments tied down with dense bodies. So you can see in its uncontracted state what it looks like versus its contracted state. What's happening is um, the contractile proteins are contracting in a way that allows the whole thing to twist. So it has this kind of like spiral appearance. And the um, intermediate filaments kind of twist with it, tying it up. So when you look at this tissue under the scope, um, here's the twisted cell contracted. They show you the thick and thin filaments there. And so a contracted smooth muscle, this is from the bladder and the urinary tract. It kind of has that squiggly appearance, all the the nuclei appear all squiggly. So um, when smooth muscle cells contract, they, they twist and they have this kind of spiral appearance. Like this cell here. S cells twist. Have a spiral appearance. So what you have to understand, if um, if you're a spindle-shaped cell, I'll just draw one layer, and you're arranged in a circle. Think about the, the lumen, the space inside you. <coughs> If all the cells are contracting and twisting, they're going to shrink that space. So um, it's hard to illustrate. Maybe they all are squished and they've, they've closed that space. And that, that's really what you expect them to do. And in, in, if you're lining a tube and you can contract the space. That'll help your digestion, that'll help um, increase blood pressure, all different kinds of things. So that's really the function of it. So what I tried to draw here, that lumen space decreased. Contracted. That's relaxed for the, for the smooth muscles that are arranged in a circle. So smooth muscle, you have unitary smooth muscle. Um, the picture is covering up the words there. That says gap junctions in unitary contraction. So the whole muscle will contract. Let me put that down. I'm going to erase all of this. Unitary recruitment. Unitary means whole. It acts as a whole unit because there are gap junctions between the cell that allow the neurotransmitters to spread easily through all the layers. Multi-unit sub, uh, multi-unit recruitment of smooth muscle. There's no gap junctions, so you have quote-unquote recruitment of motor units for a graded response, and other structures have this more graded response. 
Okay, so let's remember what made unitary recruitment possible in the presence of gap junctions. So that's really the key. So in unitary recruitment, gap junctions. Single spreads through the whole muscle, so you get the whole thing. Multi-unit recruitment, no gap junctions. So this means you have to recruit one or two, or then one, two, and three, or just one or just three. If you recruit one or more, depending on how much force you want, you get a more graded response. I'll say recruit a variable number of these sets of smooth muscles. Variable number of smooth muscle units. Let's say you have three of them. One, two, three. If you want a mild response, just have enough neurotransmitter to make one fire. If you want a stronger response, well, do one and then secrete more neurotransmitter to get two. If you need the strongest response, recruit all three. That's what they mean by graded, like low, medium, high kind of a thing. Or your grade was class, A, B, C, D, you know, hopefully you don't get that low. Um, but that's, that's what graded means, okay? It's not all or none. So instead of a T tubule system, they have the caviola. So I think that's easy enough to understand. So when smooth muscle continued, no T tubule system. This is a more simple, rudimentary caviola. The E pluralizes it. In the figure, they just show one. So there's no E, there's just one caviola. And they have the voltage-gated uh, calcium channels, which allows calcium to enter to, you know, to give you the, the, the release of more calcium. Okay. So the calcium that enters here isn't enough to get the muscle to contract. It's a little something, something. This is where your boatload of calcium comes to get the muscle to actually contract, to get that spiral appearance. They show you the molecular biology on this slide, and it's kind of different from muscle. So what I'll know for you in, the, in these steps here, it's calcium initiated. There's a calcium calmodulin kinase system. That's what it's called. We'll go over it in more detail in the molecular biology class, but let me just kind of the name of it here. So the cell physiology of it, I guess you call it molecular biology. It uses a calcium calmodulin kinase system. Just know that this is what you need to know. You don't need to know the details of it. Essentially, what you see happening here is you get your hydrolyzation of the um, activated kinase and it makes uh, the myosin head uh, pivot here in the end. So the activated myosin forms cross bridges with the actin uh, and, and the shortening begins. And it shortens in a different way. This is a very different organization here than what we saw before. Four in the skeletal muscle, for the, um, remember we studied the sarcomere? We got that M line right down the middle. You had your, your thick myosin filaments. So red is my myosin. And I'll draw, how about blue for actin, the thinner ones. And when we studied cross bridge cycling just now, 
the movement, they all slid towards the M line. This way and this way. But that's not what they're showing you for smooth muscle. For smooth muscle, well, let me draw it over here. They're pulling it in either way, one way than the other way. There's no M line here. You have, yeah, they draw a milestone there, and they draw action on either side. And from the top one, it's pulling it to the left, and the bottom one's pulling it to the right. Here, here are the cross bridges. It's going to contract and pull it that way. Here, the cross bridges are going the other way. It's going to pull it this way. That's why you get that spiral twist for the cell, because you're pulling it in both ways. Here, what's happening, you're just pulling it all this way, so the whole muscle is just shortening in contraction. Okay, so smooth muscle twists, this one does. Smooth muscle twists, um, skeletal muscle shortens. So that's it for uh, the smooth muscle. I don't do too much on smooth muscle. But I do want to go back to uh, skeletal muscle. Because for today's lab, if you looked at the schedule, it's an online lab, and I'll, I'll show that to you. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. There's something called PhysioX, and it's all available to you in the Mastering a &P. I'll, I'll show it to you where you can find it. To get you ready for that, I want to show you the type of experiments that um, they, they try to take students through. And we're still talking about muscle physiology, which is nice big muscle. But what we have students do, we, we have these, um, we isolate muscles in the lab and we string them up artificially and we stimulate them to see how muscles work. This is what physiologists did decades ago to figure out how muscles work and students typically do these in the lab. Um, when I was in grad school, I had, to, I had to sacrifice frogs. I had to decapitate them, I had to pith them. Then I give the frog to the student and um, which was very, I didn't like doing that, killing frogs and chop their heads off. It's not a very uh, pleasant thing to do. But for science, we have students, they would dissect out the gastroc muscle and just string that thing up, just like you see here. You just isolate the muscle. It's called the isometric um, muscle prep. You typically use a small animal like a frog or maybe a small mammal. We would use the hamstring or the gas. I think we use gas, the calf muscle, calf straw. We isolate that one. Isolate, dissect out a muscle. Maybe it's from the calf. You know, small animal. You set that up. Now, to kind of like understand what you're going to do when you see this in the Physio X, well, let's understand the basic idea of, of when muscles contract. And they, they give the example here of the shoulder muscle, the picture I included here, isometric concentric, eccentric. So let's call this whole muscle contraction, the different kinds. I think I like to use the hinge example. Say that's a bone, and here's, a, here's another bone. They're connected at this joint. That, the joint is the thing that moves, and the muscle must cross the joint to move it. Here's muscle. The 
And of course, you got your tendons on either side, but you got the belly of the muscle right there. This whole muscle right there. And let's say you're, um, <coughs> let's say you're pulling on some kind of chain or rope that's anchored to the ground. And you're just going, Hugh! just generating as much force as you can. But you can't obviously break the chain. Um, but the muscle's in a state of contraction. But you're not moving the joint, you're just kind of in this steady state. And so when the muscle length doesn't change and it's in a state of contraction, they call that isometric contraction. That's one type. Because iso means same, so this means same length. So muscles in, muscle is in a state of contraction. But it's not actually contracting, it's actually, but the, the length doesn't change. Length stays the same. So let's say, let's change this scenario here. Maybe it's just a weight, maybe 25 lbs, 25 pounds. And let's say you try to like curl that, and that that's something you can handle. So you'd actually move the joint, so maybe you go from there, like, you, you know, maybe, um, the muscle shortens, because it can overcome that load and move it. Yeah, I mean, you have to generate 25 pounds, move 25 pounds, well, technically 25.00001 has to be greater than that weight, and you lift it. The muscle shortens. And if you could measure this length, it would be shorter. So we call that, um, well, that's not isometric anymore. That's, um, we call that isotonic concentric. From there to there. So that means, uh, I'm sorry, I misspelled it, isotonic, not isotonic, isotonic. Iso means same tone. What that means is, through this motion, from there to there, the weight didn't change. It stayed the same. So the tone, the muscle tone you needed to overcome that weight was the same through this range of motion, from here to this flexion, okay? Same tone, the weight didn't change. Now, you can have situations where it's variable, like those resistance bands, like the Bowflex, or it's not, it's not a weight, it's this resistance band, where at the beginning of the rep, it's a little easier. But as you kind of pull harder, that thing gets stretched out, it gets harder and harder throughout the repetition. That's an example of variable resistance, which is fine, but we're just not talking about that here. This is isotonic. Okay? The resistance of the weight doesn't change. It's 25 pounds. Well, you could do the opposite. Um, let, let's say you switch that out with a 50-pound weight. Boop. Someone plays a trick on you. You're like, oh my, it's too heavy. So you try to put it down in a nice controlled motion. Don't just let it drop on your foot. Just put it down in a nice controlled motion like that on the desk. So in that situation, it's too heavy. You would put it down in a nice controlled fashion. So you go from here to like 
you know, place it on the table. Put the weight down. The muscle's getting longer, right? And it's in a state of contraction. You're trying to control the movement. That's called isotonic eccentric. Where the muscle's in a state of contraction, but the muscle's getting longer. So you're in a state of contraction. muscle length is getting longer. Isotonic concentric was the muscles in a state of contraction and it shortened. And when you put the weight back down, that's eccentric. Okay, I mean every time you lift weights, I mean you, you curl, you go up, and you go down, you go up, you go down. Weight lifters call it the negative when you go down. It's a very important part of lifting weights. It causes, um, you know, you ever been sore after you work out for the first time? That it's usually caused by the eccentric. That's what we know. It's caused by the negative, the eccentric. But we think it's due to a breakdown of the connective tissues. You know, like the epimyceum, the paramyceum, all, have, all the connective tissues, the tendons. Um, when they study this, what they do is they. Uh, Just someone hands the subject the weight, and the, the guy just goes like this, and he's giving the weight, and he just put it down, put it down, put it down. They try to induce the soreness. Um, but anyways, for us, just you know isotonic eccentric. So 50, 50, the weight doesn't change. So those are the basic terms. So the effect of athletic training, muscles that function under no load, even if they're exercised for hours on end, increase little in strength. So doing cardio workout won't increase your muscular strength. It'll do something, but it won't hypertrophy the muscle like we can see with weight training. Muscles that contract at more than 50% max force of contraction will develop strength rapidly. Muscle building. Six near max reps performed in three sets per day, three days a week give you a simple guideline. This will give optimal increase in muscle strength without producing chronic muscle fatigue. Uh, with training, muscles can hypertrophy due to 3D, 30 to 60 percent due to increase in uh, muscle fiber size. And that's the desirable like beach body effect, right? That's what we all want when we work out. And what you're doing is you're, you're increasing the number of mild fibers. You're not increasing the number of muscle fibers, okay? Um, so to figure out what your max is, your max is what you, for whether it's curl or bench press or pull down, whatever it is, it's what you can do, say twice, once or twice, depending on who you talk to. Uh, I talked to a bodybuilder, he said, well, I got twice, because the first one doesn't really count, because you get a lift off and it's not a full rep. So, but the second rep, that, that's you're doing it, okay? So what you could do twice. You know, the anabolic steroids that athletes like to abuse, if, you, if you're on the steroids, which you shouldn't be, uh, you could lift your max every day, okay? Maybe three times a day. You can get these as big as a house, right? Uh, but normally, you know, this is kind of the general guideline. You don't ever work out regularly with your max, just near max. You don't want to tear a bicep, right? Or a tricep or a pec. Anyways, we suggest resistance training uh, as any part of um, regular healthy exercise, not just athletes. Everyone should be doing some kind of resistance training for health. Um, to get back to the language here, so these phasic contractions that I've defined, I really want to emphasize those, isometric, concentric, eccentric. But know that like, you know, knee-jerk reflex, um, that's not voluntary, that's an involuntary reflex. Um, we have those type of contractions. Um, tonic contraction refers to muscle tone. Even when you're sitting down, you're not using the big quad muscles, but there's still tone there, even when muscles are at rest. 
as long as the nerve is working, there's always a communication between your muscles and your nervous system, even when muscles are relaxed. There's always muscle tone. It's only when you rip out a nerve and the muscle is completely flaccid and paralyzed do you not have tone. So in the lab, you're going to study how muscles work with when you stimulate them in a lab type setup. And I, I'm really glad we have the computer simulation, so I don't, I don't have to like kill frogs. Uh, and I think students appreciate that too. So in the Physio X lab, we, we generate the, this twitch response. And here, here's kind of the setup you would do if you were to do this old school lab physiology way. So you got your prep there. You got your little computer screen set up. Well, back in the day, it was chart paper and ink. So pretend you're a physiologist and you want to understand how muscle works. Nobody knows. It's the, I don't know, the 1950s. The most significant work was done in the 70s, the 1970s. And this is kind of what they did to figure out how muscle works, and you're doing the same experiments. So you got your muscle prep there, you got your muscle wall um, strung up there. Uh, okay, let me draw it closer over here so I get more room to get off the side. Let's pretend you just draw it here. this like little flexible wire here. So here's my muscle right here. <coughs> We would have it hooked up to, this is a, a force transducer. This muscle is hooked up to it, and this metal is like this wire that can kind of bend a little bit. It can give a little bit, because when you stimulate this muscle, it's going to twitch. When it twitches, it kind of like shortens, it twitches. And this bendable piece of metal on the force, it, it can detect that force when the muscle twitches. And it can send those signals, well, like, you know, to your, to your amplifier. Fire um, does is it has electrodes so you can shock it so you can zap your muscle. So what's my right pin? So you have positive negative electrodes. Those are your amp. And there's a few things you can do. You can set the electricity to stimulate your muscle, your voltage and you can set your frequency of stimulation to, to literally zap it with that voltage. So millivolts, say, set it at 8.2. They got 8.2 on the figure there. Maybe it's less, maybe it's more. It depends on your muscle. How much of a jolt do you need to give it to get the thing to, to twitch? Uh, and so, stimulus button, stim. You know, zap it. Give, give it a jolt there. Well, anyways, uh, so what they did was back in, really back in the day, they didn't have computers. So they, they would literally have, I think it's easier to understand too, they'll have an ink pen hooked up to this thing. go and your chart paper would start running. It's time. And 
And so you hit the chart paper, it starts running. And it's running, you're not doing anything, so it's like zero, right? You're not reading anything. Zero, 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 nothing. Zero. So maybe this is tension you're trying to measure, tension of force generated. So when you hit the stimulate button and you zap it with that 8.2 millivolts, the muscle contracts and it shortens. Okay, it literally twitches like this. So we call this the muscle twitch. It's a lab phenomenon. So when you feel your muscle twitching, say in your eye or anywhere in your body, that feels weird. You think something's wrong. This is not how muscle works. But what the muscle twitch is, it's how muscle responds to a single stimulus. Let me write that down. That's the muscle twitch, a lab phenomenon. When your muscles normally twitch, something's wrong. <laughs> But so this is how we study it. How does it respond to one zap? Okay, so let's say you zap it and the muscle twitches. It makes the ink pen twitch with it. So when the ink pen twitches, it generates this curve. Okay, when the muscle twitches, it goes, it makes it go like that. I mean, I didn't draw it exactly like that. Well, you should study that, not my little hump there. But the point is, it, it generated force by twitching it. And so that's what you guys are going to be doing. So any questions on this, this setup? This is kind of like the lab. I'm just trying to show you a lecture so when you do it, you, you have a rough idea. Okay, but by, by setting up the force transducer here, you can kind of see the muscle twitching. It makes this wave like that. So when you, when you study that figure, let me back it up a slide. Here's what you need to understand about the muscle twitch. So I'm going to erase this now. first stimulate, zap it, that's the arrow, time zero. Notice nothing happens for a few milliseconds. That's called a latent period. If you want to color code it, it's the darkest blue on the left. It's the first couple few milliseconds. You stimulate the muscle, but nothing's happening. Zero tension. Uh, no tension measured yet. Things are happening. The cross bridge cycling is still happening. You're, you you've just released calcium. You just haven't. It just hasn't registered on your graph yet. But then. In the, um, from here to here, the period of contraction, you are starting to build your tension. Okay. So it takes about 30 milliseconds, roughly, minus the laying period, so maybe 27 milliseconds. Roughly the first 30, the period of contraction. You're building that you can measure and record data, exclamation point. So for us in our lecture, we talked about the cross bridge cycling. It's occurring. But when you reach the peak tension, that's the max cross bridge cycling there. Okay. That, that, for that stimulation, that, that's the most force you can get. Cross bridge. Cycling. That's what's happening inside the cell, though you can't see it. 
Okay, and then, you know, you, the muscle is allowed to relax. And that period is the longest. So it looks like it goes from about 30 to about, to about 130. So a little more than 100 milliseconds to completely relax. declines, decreases, however you want to put it. What's happening is you're not building the cross bridge cycling. The muscle is relaxing. So maybe the calcium is being pumped back in the, into the SR, the sarcoplasm in particular. So that will that'll allow the muscle to relax. So that's everything that happens with just one zap. That's one twitch. Okay. So that's our setup. Now what you could do is you can start messing with things. You could kind of like, well, okay, if that's what happens with one twitch. What happens if we mess with the frequency of stimulation? Okay, so I have two variables here. You can zap the muscle more to see how muscle works. This is the whole point of being a physiologist. How does muscle work? It's too boring just to zap it once and then just learn about the twitch. It does more than that. But also, since you have it set up like this, you can kind of pull this thing down or up to stretch the muscle out or not to see if, like, you really stretch it out, can it still generate force? Um, so the first thing is, well, why don't you, like, stimulate it more than one time? And so let's talk about that. Let's say, for example, and, you know, there's some experiments where you can do that. You twitch it, you stimulate here, but then before the muscle completely relaxes, stimulate it again. Okay, so that's why I ask you these questions. How long is the contraction phase? How long is the reaction phase? And predict what would happen if you were to re-stimulate the muscle right here, just in terms of the force generated. Do you think more force would be generated? Less force would be generated, or the same? I guess those are the three possibilities. But what do you think? If you re-stimulate before it gets to zero, more, less, same. Well, think about it. Here's what happens if you re-stimulate and you let the muscle completely relax for a while. Do you generate more, less, or the same? Same. what you're measuring, force. Tension is a pulling force. That's what muscles do. Muscles pull, they never push. And we usually, usually use units of grams or kilograms. So what the heck is a kilogram of force? Um, it's like if you ha held a weight at the end of a rope, say 25 pounds, and it's pulling down on the rope you're holding. You can feel how much that weighs. So that tension is what we're talking about here, the tension of dangling a weight on the bottom of a string or a rope or something. So anyways, I don't know, let's try to put a number to this. Let's say four, four grams. Okay, I'll just say it like right that. And you're going at time zero, and you like, you like, uh, you zap it right there. And you, and you get your twitch. But then you let it completely relax for a while and then stimulate again. And what did you say? You get more or less or same? Same. If the muscle is allowed to completely relax for a while, no more force is generated. Okay, so that's boring. Okay, so then do, do it again. Stimulate there. But now, let's stimulate it again as soon as it reaches that zero baseline. Let's time it perfectly. So it gets there and hit the stimulate the zap button again. What happens is it actually get, generates more force. 
And if you stimulate it again, it'll actually generate more force. So that becomes more interesting. So like, okay, I'm generating more force now. And they call this the effect of trap. You're allowing the muscle to return to zero, but as soon as you zap it again, you don't give it that elongated time to relax. It's able to generate more force. Okay, and that's not shown on that figure. All right, so then to go back to that question, what happens if you stimulate before you even allow it to return to zero? More, more, more. So let's, okay, what does that look like? Okay, so let's say you zap. And then before it even returns to baseline, maybe you let it get to there and then you zap again. What happens is it looks like this. Then you let it go down a little bit and you zap it again. And you generate more force. So this kind of herky-jerky thing, they call this the wave summation. So you're kind of adding up the force. You're generating, you're generating more and more force. Now this becomes more and more interesting because you're like, oh, wow, this is doing a lot more than before. Wave summation. Uh, they call this one an unfused tetanus. Whereas, when you keep, let's say you stimulate it with a higher frequency, so putting the arrows closer together, what might that look like? Uh, you're generating even more force. Okay, unfused tetanus. And then if you really uh, zap it, you can set the, the amplifier to stimulate at even a higher frequency. Get this nice fused tetanus, and you finally drop off after you stop stimulating. They call that, you know, fused tetany. That's all the muscle can do. And if you were to measure that, something like, I don't know, 12. Muscles, um, when they achieve tenderness, you can achieve about three times of a single twitch. Okay, and that, that's the physiology. So that, that's what you would measure opposed, as opposed to a single twitch. Muscle can about three times the force integrity. I mean, it's not drawing the scale here, but you should be able to recognize waveforms like if I were to throw something to you on a test. If there were multiple choice, what would you call C? Fused. Fused or unfused? I would call this one the unfused. That one's the fuse. Well, if that's unfused, what would you call that? Waves. Wave summation. And that would be like a single twitch. Uh, the other thing you could do is you can mess with the, the length. They call this the length tension relationship. So how much, what's the initial muscle length? You know, how much acting mouse and overlap is there. That's kind of what you're trying to see there. And so the, the concept for that second one is if you you could take a microscope and look inside at the sarcomere, what's what's the best length? Let me let me illustrate this. Let's so what I'm erasing is frequency of stimulation. This is muscle length. Length, tension, 
relationship. In the first thing I just embraced, it was the frequency of stimulation tension relationship. And in muscle, as a physiologist, you're always like, I want to see what this thing can do max. What's the max? What's the most this thing can do? Okay. Um, so what we see, zap the heck out of that thing. Make it reach tendon. It will achieve the most. For this, you're, you're saying, can the muscle be kind of like stretched out? Can it be like kind of shortened? And if it is, could it generate as much tension? So for example, in your prep, if, so let's say this is like kind of like a normal length. Okay, whatever it is. Let's say you can measure it. But let's say since you got it all strung up, you could like really stretch it out. Or, or let's say you could even shorten it a little. These three lengths that you can kind of like start start out with, and you're asking yourself each time when you zap it, I mean, what's the response going to be? Does the length have an effect on the tension? And if you were to look under the microscope, <coughs> I, I don't know. A would be which one of these? For a second, the first one. Okay, you're thinking about the sarcomere length, so. So our M line. <coughs> Same thing about the sarcomere length. Okay. But if it's all stretched out, the sarcomere is going to be much longer, right? It's going to be like, like. It's going to be too stretched out. And if the muscle is too slack like that, if you were to look at the sarcomere under the microscope, it might look something like uh, What I want you to look at is the zone of overlap of actin and myosin. There's a best one. Consider zone of overlap. I mean, I, do, I did rudimentary pictures on the board, but you got it right there. Which one do you think is the best to generate the most force, A, B, or C? Just guess, it's not a quiz, you're not going to lose points. Anyone think this one's the best? A is the best. Okay, and let's, let's explain why these other two aren't as good. Okay, this one. Do you have any, any overlap here? Barely. So you're not going to be able to generate as many cross bridges. This one, you got plenty of overlap. But is there room to slide? You're supposed to slide towards the M line, but they're already there. So it's like you could generate force, but not as much. So that's why this one best. And this um, they call this the resting length sometimes. When I read that, I, I take it to mean it's the anatomy. It's how your muscles <laughs> are arranged in your body in the best resting length. We can generate the more, more full, the most force, but you can even see this if you like lift weights, like if you're doing um, a curl, and it's like you try to try to curl a heavy weight, and your arms are completely extended. It's hard to get it started, so you cheat and you just kind of flex a little more, and it's easier when you're a little bit more flexed because you're you're getting a better overlap there so you can generate more force. That's why it's easier. So you're not really cheating. You're just taking advantage of how muscle actually works. So that's the other thing you're going to mess with. 
And what you're going to see is like whatever the best is, that resting weight would symbolize with that little L naught. You ever see that on a test or something? It is the best length. Uh, it's the optimal overlap. It's too stretched out here and it's too like squished there. That's the other experiment there. And, but they graph this out, of course. So understand this. That if you're at that resting length and you graph it out, you achieve the most force. Whatever it is, call it 100%. Percent of max. So that's your max, 100%. When you stretch it out too much, it starts to drop off really fast as you increase the muscle weight. And if you decrease it the other way, it starts to drop off. Okay, they're calling that 75% of this length, and they're call, I'm calling this 170% of that initial length. Okay, so it's all about the sarcomere length, and that's the length tension uh, relationship. Okay, what I want to do now is, um, I'll finish these slides Wednesday, but I want to tell you how you can access the PhysioX online. And I'll finish teaching this on Wednesday. student view so this looks exactly like when you'll see it when you do it. <laughs> 